Hi, my name is Shane Mitchell. We've just come back from a lovely sunny holiday in Miami, where most of the time we were checking out chicks. But anyways, this is my co-host. Well, I'm just Adam Brown, and today is a special day for exposure. We've just been given the honor of interviewing the one and only Duncan Bannatyne. We brought him into the studio for our wannabe studio reporters Ben Atkins and Joe Hall to ask him some questions. So now let's see what Mr. Bannatyne actually said. So it's now over to our usual outside reporters, Ben and Joe. Thanks Adam, thanks Shane. As you may have noticed, we're not in our normal outside location. Yes, this is because today we have been given the chance to interview Duncan Bannatyne. As everyone knows, Duncan Bantai is most famous for his entrepreneur skills in appearing on Dragon's Den. But is there more to Duncan Bannatai than we know? Let's find out. You are best known for being an entrepreneur. What is your first business and how did you become successful as you are today? Well, my first business was selling ice cream. I bought an ice cream van and started selling ice cream when I was 30 years old. I was working in a bakery at the time. I'd arrived back in the UK from Jersey, completely penniless, aged 29. And by the time I was 30, I'd bought a house and a mortgage with a, a hard work at the bakery. I bought an ice cream van for £650, started selling ice cream. How did you get on to Dragon's Den? I was just minding my own business, running the business up, and I was approached by someone who says, um, we're doing a new programme called Dragon's Den. Would you like to audition for it? And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, somebody comes in and sees you and chats to you. And they came and they said, OK. Well, they sort of run through and the five dragons. Not many people know this, but the original five dragons aren't the five dragons that are on now. Um, one of the dragons didn't make it, so they changed that dragon and Simon Woodruff came in, but I won't name the person who didn't make it and got sort of kicked out. But uh, four of us passed the edition, one didn't. What was the best and the worst idea you heard whilst on Dragon's Den? Do you know, I think we've got a list of so many worst ideas. It depends how you look at it. In the early times, there was um, the cardboard beach furniture. And I think the lady's name was Gail Honeyford. And she said, nobody's going to use cardboard beach furniture. They're going to use cardboard beach furniture from now on because we can advertise in this site and get the revenue from the adverts. And I said, what happens if it rains? And she looked at me with eyes that could burn right through your soul. And she said, you don't go on the beach if it rains. She says, what if my boy Tom, who's 10, comes out to sea and sits on the cardboard beach furniture? She says, Tell them not to. Discipline your children. So that was a terrible idea. But I don't know if that's worse than the guy who invented the single glove. He said when he goes and drives in France, he drives on the wrong side of the road, and he forgets sometimes, so he wears a white glove. So what he'd done is he'd packaged up a white glove, he was going to sell it at ferry ports. So if you're going to the other side of the continent, you'd buy this and you'd put the glove on your left hand. I said, but that's crazy. What if a Frenchman's coming back and he wants to buy a glove? He'd have to buy a right-hand glove. And he said, that's right. I said, well, it's a pair of gloves, a left hand and a right-hand glove. So that idea didn't get any investment. The best ideas were, of course, the one that's doing fantastic is Reggae Reggae Sauce, um, which is selling all over the country and probably worldwide now uh, by a fantastic guy called Levi Roots, who's done fantastic at Dragon's Den because it's like he's on a television show, which we can't even get. He's selling books, not as well as mine, but he's selling books. And uh, the other one is a very boring one called um, Chuck Box, which is a little electrical box I invested in. And that is doing absolutely fantastic financially. That is actually the best one for the return on capital invested. Can you tell us about Bright Sparks and why you think it's a good opportunity for young people in Darlington? Bright Sparks is a, is a fantastic concept. Um, it allows the school to compete with each other. And the teenagers come in front of us and they have their idea as to what they would do with an investment. It gets them thinking about it for the year. And uh, someone wins, and uh, the next year they'll come back again to try again. It just, it's a no-brainer. It's going to help people to think, <coughs> think in the right direction. And uh, those that get investment will carry on with the business idea and see if it works. It's been reported you do a lot for charity. Can you tell us about this charity work and why you do it? I'm involved with um, 32 charities now. And the reason I do it is because, partly because I, I really enjoy it. I opened an orphanage some 14 years ago in Romania, and all the kids were sort of tied to beds and held in a little room. They were all HIV, all abandoned by their parents. We took the 10 kids and we put them into the orphanage. There's three orphanages in a little row, so there's 24 kids all together. And now these kids have grown up over the 12 years. They're 17, 18 years old. They're getting married. It's fantastic. I'm going to the weddings just so um, so enjoyable, it's just so much a big part of my life that I just can't stop doing it. 
I've just got back from Haiti. When I was in Haiti, I was in a nice hotel, but there's no hot water for five days. So I didn't shave, and that's why I've got the beard. And I came back, my wife said she quite liked it, so I've, uh, I've kept the beard. And I uh, just came out there and seen how we can feed children out there uh, through a, a charity called Mary's Meals, and how we can actually help people out there to sort of improve, which is very, very difficult. It's a difficult country to see it improve. Many people have said, the problem is that the money hasn't been spent in Haiti. But you can't spend it. I'm an ambassador of UNICEF. We've pledged money to Haiti. The local branch haven't drawn the money down because the trouble is they're in a tented village. You can't build houses because nobody knows who owns the land. They won't let you build houses. And the people are moving from the slums into the tent because it's better than accommodation was before the earthquake. And that's the way the cycle goes. The country cannot feed its own people. It has to import food. It can't grow enough to feed. And so it's a bankrupt country, country or a bankrupt island. And uh, we have to try and solve that problem because it's got beautiful beaches and we should have tourism in there. We should go and build a 500 bedroom hotel with two casinos and the whole place will be saved. I say that sort of um, tongue in cheek, but that's the sort of thing we need to do, get tourism in there and get it working. What are you doing at the Northern Echo today? Today I'm guest editor for the Northern Echo. I'm going to edit it. I'm going to make sure it's um, written properly and it's going to be a really good read. Finally, we received a question from the Northern Echo reader, David Waring. He'd like to know if you were Prime Minister for the day, what three things would you change to improve the country? If I was Prime Minister for the day, the trouble is being Prime Minister for the day, you can't really change things because things take a, a long time to change. But I would certainly start the cycle going to change the tax laws in this country. There's so many unfair taxes in this country and so many people who live here tax-free, they're called non-doms and they make money in this country. They get benefits in this country and then pay no taxes. I'd change that. I'd move very, very fast to ban smoking in cars with children and I'd, I'd hope that I'd start the cycle where we could actually bring in a situation in Great Britain where nobody smokes and smoking becomes banned. Um, and the third thing, I mean, I'd do whatever I could within my powers to sort of eradicate child poverty, but that's not easy to do in one day. I'd have to look at that very carefully and see how we can do it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So. That's the interview with Duncan Bertine. We're really thankful for Duncan coming in and giving up his time for this edition of Exposure. I think that's about it. Tune in next week for our episode of, uh, it's actually our Red Nose Day special of Exposure next week. It's pretty late. Yeah, it's rather late, but uh, you, know, you know. Well, that's another great episode. Good night and God bless.